Welcome back to the podcast. It's been a while since I did a podcast. It's been actually a couple of weeks. With all this coronavirus and all this shutdown, lock-in stuff going on, I um, hope it's not driving you guys as nuts as it's driving me. It's kind of crazy just being isolated, being shut in. But being shut in and, and locked down and away from you know, society kind of reminded me of what shelter dogs go through. And those of you who know me know that my real passion is animals. I love animals, whether it's the animals in Africa, the animals in shelters, and any, any animals I'm super connected to, I'm super, super uh, uh, have an affinity to helping animals. So I want to talk to you today really about um, Bound Angels. Bound Angels is an organization that I started some God, 12 plus years ago. And I'll tell you how I started. I'll tell, I'll tell you all about it. It'll be a little narrative on, on Bound Angels and what really makes me tick for, for the most part. So, so in 2007 or so, I was living in Nashville. I was about to come back here to L.A. I spent two years down there. And I had my dog, Silly. It was a Sharpay. It was an amazing dog. The dog really changed my life. So um, I loved this dog. And because I loved this dog, I wanted to do something special for a dog that didn't have anybody else. So I went to the shelter, I'd go buy a 20 pound bag of food, a 50 pound bag of food, I'd bring it to the shelter, do this over and over again. Then I started slowly venturing into the back. At the time I was working as a photographer, I was doing music photography in Nashville, and um, I started taking pictures. I had no idea really why I was doing what I was doing, but I was taking pictures of these dogs in the shelters and just sharing them, just sharing them with people. There was, I didn't back then have Facebook or anything like that. Around 2007 or so, now they're getting more in mid, maybe that happened 2006, 2007, I was um, moving back to LA and um, went to local shelters. And I took pictures here and did some videos and I would introduce dogs to other dogs and I would introduce dogs to um, people and see how they would do. And all that started doing this thing called the temperament test to see how the dog's temperament would fare in certain environments. And so when a dog, if you can temperament test a dog, you can tell, tell somebody something about the dog. I don't believe in temperament tests, by the way. I'll talk about that in another podcast. But I really fell for these animals, these dogs living in shelter. So I wanted to do something more. So I started shooting these little videos. And I made these little YouTube videos. They were called shelter, um, shelter Angel Videos. And I would share them back then, you know, you could send a link to something from YouTube or, you know, then I started slowly starting doing Facebook and all that. Well, I thought I should do something more. So I started this, this nonprofit called Bound Angels. And I called it Bound Angels because I thought these animals, dogs, <clears throat> were living in captivity and bondage. And I thought they were angels. So well, that's where the name really came from. And I... Um, really started growing attached to these dogs. I really wanted to do like a sanctuary idea or, or a rescue idea and stuff, but I didn't want to have the dogs coming in to live with me because I knew once they came to live with me, that's it, right? I'm not going to get rid of them once they start living with me. So um, the idea was really that I would work with these dogs. I just I, I do pictures and videos and stuff like that. And so slowly as I started getting these dogs homes, my veterinarian said to me, you know, how did, how did you do this? What, what, what was it about, you know, the, 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 these dogs are so well behaved when they're with you. Who trained them? And I said, nobody really trained them. I, I just worked with them. She said, well, you should be a dog trainer. Now, that's a, a podcast for a whole different topic. That was Dr. Lisa. And I'm going to have her on, on the podcast one of these days when we're not shut down, when we're not socially isolated from each other. But um, the, the main thing, what I want to get to here is, is this Bound Angels, my organization that I started and that I'm so passionate about. And I've just done so many great things with it. Not I've done so many great things with it. I've been able to facilitate great things through the organization. I want to talk to you about that. So when I first started the organization, we were doing these videos and getting dogs together. And that was the first start of the playgroup thing. The LA City Shelter had never done playgroups, had never wanted dogs playing with each other. I started that. That was basically in 2000 eight or nine back then when I was just doing these videos and these little introductions. Later, uh, the city of Los Angeles came to me formally and asked me to do their play, their first playgroup programs. And I'll talk about playgroups at another time. I'm going to make all these mental notes of all these different things I want to talk to you about. 
But the idea was really these dogs living in what I considered to be these deplorable conditions. And that was in the shelter, living on concrete floors behind steel bars. I just, I, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't imagine why people would give up on these dogs. So I decided to start this organization. Back then I called, made a phone call to the head of the LA City Shelter System. His name was Ed Bokes back then. We've remained friends for many, many years afterwards. And I said, there's a better way to do these things. There's a, there's a, I think there's a better way. And so we started working together. And um, since then, Ed had left the city shelter and went to um, another shelter in Arizona and then some, some other places. And I've always worked with him. He's always been a really good guy. He's always really cared about animals. But um, my work took me through, I've worked with the LA city shelter system since 2000, I would say eight. So in 2020 now, so it's 12, 12 plus years. And all that work has really shown me that there's a lot of good that can come out of this, right? There's a lot of good that can come out of helping these dogs. It's changed, it changed my life completely, right? It, it really, I, I cut my teeth in the shelters, working with training these dogs, working on their behaviors, doing the play groups, training employees, training volunteers, training people from all over the country who've come to Bound Angels University to learn a better way to handle dogs. Because for the most part, in shelters across this country, they are run by, managed by, and executed by, and executed as far as meaning, making decisions, people who have really very little background in dealing with the kind of dogs that are living in shelters, which is completely bizarre to me. Most of the em employees really aren't trained in dog training or in dog behavior. They're trained to just take a dog, put them, you know, it's a, a lot of them, I will say, love dogs. So it's not, I'm not going to say they're, they're just there to collect a paycheck. There are, there are plenty there are like that. But for the most part, they're not trained to really understand dogs. And that's bewildering to me. Right? So animal shelters spend millions and millions and millions of dollars handling dogs, putting dogs down, caring for them, feeding them, giving them vet care, but very, very little money on training them, on understanding what a dog needs to be trained, to be a functional member of society. And Bound Angels started out with this idea of marketing these dogs for adoption. But I quickly noticed that what was missing was this idea of training the dogs, of working with the dogs. Are, is the dog dangerous, right? If the dog is truly dangerous, then let's put it down. Let's put the dog down and let's move on because there's plenty of good dogs in shelters so that if we can clearly determine is a dog dangerous, then the dog should be put down. There's no question in my mind. Right? Those people will say, well, you can handle the dog. The dog's dangerous. You can handle it. And that's true. But I don't want to handle it. Right? Uh, but you can, you can make the dog better. I could, and I have. But the dog still will need to be managed. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of dogs that are killed in our nation's shelters every single year that are great dogs. They were just given up on by somebody. Somebody didn't want them anymore, couldn't care for them anymore, didn't understand them anymore, grew sick of them, whatever it was, and then dumped them at a shelter. Some, the very small minority of the dogs are there because their owner died, got, you know, something happened, went to jail, whatever. But that's the smallest numbers. The biggest numbers are gonna be from the morons who have backyard breeding, Right, who don't, who can't place all the puppies, or somebody who got a dog from a backyard breeder who can't keep it, and the breeder, quote unquote, backyard breeder won't take it back. Shelters are the least impacted by dogs from legitimate breeders because a legitimate breeder will always, always, always take a dog back, right? Whether the dog is sick or dangerous and they have to put the dog down or whether the dog just can't, you know, isn't doing well in the home or the people can't keep it, whatever, whatever the reason is, a, a legitimate breeder, a good breeder, an ethical breeder will take the dog back. That, that I can tell you right now. So, so those are not the people burdening our shelter system. So my thought was if I could teach employees and management and volunteers 
how to better understand canine behavior, how to work with dogs, how to train dogs, how to understand them better. We could place more dogs. And that was proven. We've proven that because I did it in Ventura County, which was at a very, very, very high kill rate. And with my program and working with the um, person who was the interim director there, Donna Gillespie, um, we took those numbers and had a live release rate in the, I think, mid to high 80s which is very, very good because I think we started somewhere in the 60s. I'm not, don't quote me on that one, but it was very low. So Donna and I got this program done. She was fantastic. She reached out to me when the then director had quit or gotten fired or something. I don't know what happened. And by the way, shelter directors are always getting fired or quitting or whatever. It's a super stressful job. It's not a job I would ever want to do, although the job was offered to me at, at a shelter once. I'm not telling you where, but I, t I turned it down. Um, so we went in there and we did that. I did it with Ed Bokes at LA City and then I continued to do it at, at LA City with Brenda Barnett. Um, and what I did is I went in, I would, we did the playgroup program. I didn't, was not a big fan of the playgroup thing. I did it because, you know, the court of public opinion deemed that um, what dogs really need in, shel in the shelter environment is to be, um, they call it enrichment, right? And the enrichment means that the dog is going to be Enriched. The dog is going to be stimulated every day. The dog's going to get a Kong with some peanut butter. It's going to get a walk. It's going to get this. It's going to get that. It's going to be a playgroup. So the playgroup, they, they thought, would be this big um, epiphany where dogs would get out every single day. They would get to play in a group, whether it's a group of two or three or 10 or 20. And my friend Lewis at the time um, did the program with me. And Lewis and I had been friends for years and done trained together, hung out together, really saw eye to eye on how to do this. And we developed a playgroup program that was very, very unique. And I'll tell you how unique it was. In the multitude of years that we did it together and that I did it since he retired, I never, to this day, touch wood, had a serious injury. When I say a serious injury, I mean an injury, basically, right? I don't mean just a, a serious injury where somebody died. I mean, basically, no injury. In other words, no injury ever... No injury ever uh, required veterinary attention. Never. There's nobody else who can say that. Right? Because I ran playgroups completely strict. I was very strict about it. And that was the principle behind Bound Angels. That is, if it, if it can't help the dogs, then don't do it. If it's going to harm the dogs, then don't do it. Right? I wasn't believing that, oh, well, some dogs are going to get hurt in order to help the greater number of dogs. I didn't think that was a good idea. I thought that was a very biased and judgmental way to do it. So my playgroups, the way I did them, was taking the dogs and structuring introductions, structuring the playgroup. And basically, what you're really talking about is having a dog Nazi in every group. The fun police would be there. So if there was too much fun going on, we curbed it. Now, since... I'd been doing it. I also had another person join me who worked for me named Peter. And Peter was a fantastic guy. He knew dogs. He, could, he learned to read dogs better. He learned how to handle dogs. And he worked with me for three plus years. And in all that time, we never had a serious injury. It wasn't until people started stepping in and trying to be, you know, heroes and getting more and more dogs out. And a lot of times this would happen when people who weren't physically able, one, and two, um, emotionally able or, or, or in a mental capacity able to judge dogs. And they would let dogs out that shouldn't be together, that I would have never put together. And if you can't physically correct the dog or, or stop the dog from a behavior or pull the dog off of another dog, then you shouldn't be handling those dogs. But that's what happens. So you get these people in there who are all great feeling, emotional people who want to help dogs. And a lot of these people are women. And then they get these big dogs out and these dogs start fighting and they don't have the physical capacity to block the behavior or stop it. Right? They don't have the physical presence to do it. And this could be a small man. It can be an older man. It can be a woman. It can be whoever. It can be a, of any gender. I don't even know how many genders there are nowadays, but it could be any gender. It could be any person. I know my limits, right? If I had three lions, I, don't, I wouldn't let them play because I don't think I could break up three lions fighting. By that same token, a person should know their physical capacity and shouldn't let 
three, four, five, six, 60, 70 pound dogs play. I don't care if they're shepherds, pit bulls, mastiffs, uh, you know, if they're overgrown Jack Russell Terriers and dachshunds. It doesn't matter what they are. But that doesn't happen, right? People start getting their head full of themselves. They start getting emotional. We got to help the dogs. We got to do this, we got to do that. And dogs started getting torn apart. Right? After I stopped doing the play groups at the city shelters, they started having injuries. So my theory in starting Bound Angels was to do what's best for the dogs and to do what's best for the greater good of dogs. And that mission has never left my, my initial statement or the statement of Bound Angels. So during the shutdown, we haven't been doing as much, you know, and lately we've been very busy with other things. We're planning on putting Bound Angels University online so people can learn it. But it's such a powerful program that every shelter, and we had hundreds of participants from throughout the country, took something away. And the something they usually took away is that dogs need structure. And that structure is taken away from dogs, right? In, in the shelter, the dogs are free to bark and, and act like complete psychopaths in their kennels, and nobody does anything about it. Janet and I went to, um, to Washington, and we, we spoke at a humane society. I spoke to, she was with me, and she spoke to me, so I would say we spoke. But I spoke to a humane society for the, I think it was the humane, no, it was the ASPCA, or the SPCA, put it, somebody put it on up there, and I got invited. And I said, you're not going to like hearing what I'm about to say. And that is that dogs need structure and dogs need corrections. That's not a popular topic in shelters because most people who are doing work in shelters are going to be positive only. Right? They're, going, they're going to avoid corrections. They're going to shame you for using prong collars, e-collars, uh, even a choke chain or anything like that. And these dopes are the same ones who can't fix a behavioral problem because they're going to wait for a good behavior in market. And in a shelter environment, that doesn't happen. Right? You're being highly unfair to the dogs. What happens is if you have a really nicely bred golden retriever or border collie or Aussie or something like that, bred for compliance, you can use positive only training on that dog. But I, I say you're still going to end up with a need for corrections at some point. And if you don't wrap your head around that early on, you're gonna be sadly disappointed. And then you're gonna feel like a moron or like you failed your dog when you finally give the dog the corrections. And that's sad, right? It's like a parent who lets a child grow up until they're 15, 16 years old without ever correcting them or, or having a harsh word with them or coming to terms with them and saying, hey, listen, I'm in charge here. But that's what happens to these dogs. And then the dogs end up dumped in the shelters. And when they're in the shelters, they haven't been obviously well-behaved because if they were really well-behaved, more than likely, they wouldn't be in the shelter. Forget all the bull crap you hear from you know, big organizations that have ads on TV that tell you 30 plus percent of the dogs in shelters are purebred. They're not. If there's five or 10%, you're incredibly lucky. It's not. Shelters are full of mutts, old dogs, aggressive dogs, throwaway dogs. You'll find some good dogs there. I'm not saying you won't. But don't walk in expecting a pet shop full of labs, golden retrievers, border collies, and stuff like that. Don't do it. So the, the way I ran Bound Angels was to really make people aware of the real picture in a shelter. And I did that. I successfully did that. In fact, Adoptions went up at every shelter I went to. Behavior problems went down at every shelter I went to. You know, some people complained, and those were always the positive-only people who were like, well, Robert is too rough with the dogs. I've never been rough with a dog that didn't need to be rough with, but my roughness was basically this step in between bad behavior and death. Right? A dog that doesn't behave, a dog that's aggressive, a dog that is incapable of functioning in society on a leash or with a person is going to be killed. And if they're not, they're going to be adopted by some feel-good person who doesn't have the ability to structure that dog's life to make that dog safe and another person's or dog's life safe. If you, have, if you have a dog that's dangerous and you can't control, handle, or manage that dog, 
you're not only endangering another dog's life, but the person who's holding the leash of that dog's life, the little kid that walks in between that kid, the, those two dogs, as well as your dog, the one you're trying to keep safe, because that dog's going to get killed for bad behavior. Better to let him die before something bad happens because you can have many more uh, irons in the fire once it does, right? There's many more casualties. If we know the dog's dangerous, we put the dog down, that's it, we lose one dog. Very sad. Don't think I'm not sad about that. But reality check here. If the dog gets out and the dog does something dangerous, it's going to kill, hurt, or harm another dog and guarantee a person's going to get bit in there somewhere. God forbid if it's a kid's face or a person's face or an elderly person who can't help but fall down, break a hip or something. There's a lot of things that go into that. So the, the main point I'm trying to make here is that going into a shelter and making things work there is something I've done. I went there. I cut my teeth in the shelters. And I did it in the city of L.A., which are some of the toughest shelters around. Some of the toughest dogs are in that shelter, that shelter system of six shelters. And I made it work. You can look on my website. You can see the references I've got. It's all on paper. It's all documented. right? It's not like just me talking about it. It's all documented. My hats go off. My hat goes off to the people that I've worked with. And I'm going to list them for you. Ed Bokes did a great job. Brenda Barnett did a great job. Donna Gillespie did a great job. These are people I worked with. There's, there's more. Those are the three biggest shelters you know, people that I work with. I've lectured on this. I've, 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 I've spoken on it. I've taught, taught the behavior problems that need to be solved and how to solve them. And it works. It really works. But the shelters and the animal rights people need to get their heads out of their rear ends. And I would say the other word, but then I can't monetize my video and you won't be able to see it. You get blocked. But they need to get their heads out of their butts and understand that to save a shelter dog, you got to give that dog some structure. And that structure is going to probably involve a correction. And as long as shelters don't use prong collars, choke chains, e-collars, you're not going to block those behaviors. And anybody who says, and trust me, I see it all the time on the YouTube channel and all the comments, Oh, if you need to use a prong collar, you shouldn't have a dog. If you need to use something that harmful, you shouldn't be training dogs. But they're wrong, right? They're, they're just, they're, they're myopic. They're naive. I'd say they're stupid, but that's just because that's not really even a word that applies to them. They don't even know what to be stupid about because they've never done it. If somebody has trained dogs and had some experience and then said not to do it, then that would be stupid, right? If somebody knows what it takes to do a job and then says don't do what it takes to do that job, then they're being stupid. But if people don't know, they're just naive. They have no clue on any of this. So the shelter system needs to get their heads out of their butts and understand that, hey, we need to do some balanced training here. And there's a lot of people I know who are balanced trainers who work with rescues and who work with uh, dominant dogs or assertive dogs or dangerous dogs, whatever you want to call it. They're usually not the ones you see on YouTube. But they're working with these dogs. They're able to handle these dogs. And they're trying to do the right thing. But then they're criticized constantly by the feel-good keyboard quarterbacks who are criticizing them. And then they spend time defending themselves, which I, I, I don't know why. But that time they're spending defending themselves, they can't train dogs. And the dopes who are criticizing never do anything positive anyway, so why even respond to them? I've had critics on my channel for years. I used to say, well, show me a video of you doing something. But they don't. So I know now that when somebody criticizes something that I've done, that they haven't done it. And in the shelters. This is where the dogs need us the most, in the shelters. That's where we need to get volunteers in. We need to get people who are well-balanced trainers, who understand behavior, who aren't afraid to correct it, and who have thick enough skin to stand up to the criticism of the keyboard quarterbacks. That's all it takes. 
like I said, 12 plus years, I was in some of the, I'd say, biggest shelters. I've worked with some, I've worked with everything from the smallest shelters to the biggest shelters. LA City is probably the biggest animal control agency around, right? Most adoptions, most intake animals, it serves a huge demographic. And I received a lot of criticism from doing things that I thought needed to be done, but I kept doing it, right? I, I worked through the criticism, I didn't care. Because I knew the minute I caved to that criticism, dogs would start dying. The minute I didn't give that dog the correction that I thought it needed, it would be subject to a clicker trainer or no training at all, and wouldn't get, it wouldn't get work with. And I had to have thick skin, and I grew thick skin, and I stuck through it. And I made my way through it, and I showed that these dogs could be worked with. And I made people proud again that they're working in a shelter system, and that through no fault of their own, these dogs are getting killed. And that's really it. That, that's, you know, bound angels in a nutshell. Be sincere, be kind, be strong, and do what it takes. That's what it is. That's what shelter dogs need. Shelter dogs need structure. Shelter dogs need to understand what is required of them. They need to be shown that. They need to be corrected if they don't do it. And then they need that structure for the rest of their lives. So if you want to help shelter dogs, Go out and make a statement that shelter dogs need training. They need training as much as they need veterinary care. It's as simple as that. They don't need to be enriched. They need to be trained, right? Keeping them enriched while they're in there is nice. I get it. I'm not, I'm not going to say it's not nice to make sure they're enriched because there's some really, really good enrichment programs where they you know, give the dogs Kongs and they give the dogs good walks and they give the dogs this. But if you don't train them, if you refuse to give them that structured training that they require, then all the other stuff is useless because you're just keeping them alive and keeping them enriched in an environment that's designed to kill them. Nobody wants an unruly, untrained dog. Nobody. That's it. It's just not going to happen. So that's my spiel on Bound Angels. I'm going to answer some questions because I always like to answer questions for you guys because I think it's that important. Um, let's look at them. Let's see what we got here. Um, first question I'm going to take is goes out to Andre, Andre, Andres, Andres. I'm not sure what it is anyway. Thanks for the video. I have a small dog that seems fearful when we walk around the block or go anywhere. It's a Chihuahua Shih Tzu mix. Seems like he's scared of barking dogs, people, etc. When he was young, I took him to various places to meet people and dogs. When we go for a walk, he stops and tries to run back home as soon as we reach the other block or neighborhood. He's fine in our own neighborhood. Do you have any suggestions? There's a couple of things you can do. One is don't let him go back right away when he tries to go back because you're kind of reinforcing the behavior. Try to make him work through it. Keep him out a little bit longer. This is what I'm going to tell you to do. Keep him out a little bit longer and let the dog see that there's nothing really that bad, right? And when the dog kind of settles in, and this takes time, I'm going to be addressing this in some other videos, then, um, then take him back, right? Don't let him see that his bad behavior is getting results. That's usually the problem. So he starts acting up and you're like, okay, 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 let's go home. And the dog realizes the nuttier I get, I get what I want. But it's not what the dog wants. The dog wants to be chill. The dog wants to have a normal life. So give the dog a normal life by doing that and try that for a while. But don't give in if the dog's acting crazy. Just sit tight until the dog calms down. Natal says, we put our German Shepherd on raw, onto raw diet by changing from kibble over a six-week period. Weighing out stuff and using all food groups to make up all the requirements and broths and bones and offal, etc. Her skin and coat became dry and she just wasn't the same. We put her back into Royal Canaan German Shepherd and her coat is shiny. Her behavior is back to normal and bowel is predictable and she is at her perfect weight. I don't think there's anything wrong with either of them. We just use kibble because it's easier and she does better on it. Well, what you're saying, she did horribly on raw. And I'll tell you, unless you're really able to understand what the dog needs in a raw diet and you're doing all this stuff like um, using all the food groups, dogs don't generally eat from all the food groups. Right? In fact, no animal eats from all the food groups except for humans. And we don't eat from all the food groups. So all the food groups is usually a problem in diet. And people try to over 
think a dog's diet. I'll tell you, my dogs eat raw now. I mean, my dogs have never done better. Jimmy was on you know, a raw diet originally, and Janet told me he did horribly on it. She didn't want to put him on a raw diet because it was some kind of, it was a packaged diet, right? But basically, good healthy grass-fed meats and organ meats, sardines, you know, some kind of a fish with an oil, and a couple of vegetables that aren't sugary, you know, like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and those kind of vegetables can make for a great meal for a dog. But you need to get the dog supplemented. But anyway, it's up to you. If, you did, if it didn't work for you, I'm sorry. Then don't, don't do it. You did the right thing, you know. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of most foods, but there are some good ones. Scooby-Doo. I did exactly as this video, but it didn't work for my three-month-old husky. As soon as it, you're talking about crate training. As soon as the door is closed, she goes absolutely berserk. Barking, howling, clawing at the crate. The crate is full of treats, but as soon as the door is closed, she goes hysterical. So I tried going back a step and leaving the door open for a few days, which I think this is where you probably made your mistake, but I'm going to go through it. Tried the door closing again. Once again, she went hysterical. I lost all hope of forgetting this. So I don't know how you did this. I don't know what you went through, but the video explains it, and the video works for 99% of dogs. And maybe your dog is one of the 1% that it can't work for. That, that totally understandable. There probably are certain dogs that not everything, not, not everything works on every dog or every person or every, you know, whatever. Works on most. The mistake people make with crate training is they give in to the bad behavior. Right? The dog acts like he doesn't want to be locked up. You panic. You think, oh my God, the dog is upset. You take the dog out of the crate. The dog learns the behavior. Dog does it again. You do it again. The dog's now cemented the behavior. Now when you try to go through it and do it longer, the dog has to work harder because he knows he got it the last time. Right? In other words, if he knows if he barked for two minutes last time and you let him out, maybe this time he has to bark for three or four minutes. And then at that point, it becomes a reaffirming behavior from the dog. Right? So the dog knows the longer he barks, the harder he barks. And then at some point, the dog's going to bark for an hour. But if in the beginning you wait and you just sit through it, I went through it with, with Goofy. I went through it with Jimmy. Uh, sorry, not Jimmy, with Dwayne. I've gone through it with countless clients' dogs. I had one client where the entire first session I did with a client involved me sitting there watching this Ridgeback with Joe and Juliet screaming for 45 minutes because Joe let the dog sleep with him the night before. I said, we're not taking the dog out. That's it. 45 minutes later, the dog conked out, lay down, and I said, okay, now open the door. That was it. He was crate trained. He understood he can't get away with that. That's, you know, it, it takes that kind of tenacity on it. So you got to just see it through. Crucial Blue says, my wife and I have an 11-week-old pit bull. We wake her up after four hours to take her out. But the past week, she's very reluctant to get up and go outside. Since she's so small, we picked her up and bring her out anyway but was wondering if this is a sign that she's getting better bladder control or simply because she's groggy or lazy at 4 a.m. Thanks for your videos, by the way. They're insanely helpful. And even at 10 weeks, people are commenting to us how great we're doing with her. And it's because of the techniques in your videos. Well, thank you very much for that. That's really nice of you. And, you know, there's no sense in, you know, if you, for the first week or so, you want to get this dog out every few hours, two, three, four hours, whatever it is. I mean, maybe two hours for a while, but then four hours should be, you shouldn't have any problem with a dog making it four to six hours. So yeah, if the dog is sleeping, just wait, because once the dog starts to get that he's going to get out, there's no sense in carrying the dog outside. I don't think you're doing the dog any favors by carrying a sleeping dog outside to go potty. So just back down, just let the dog have its way. Nadia says, nice video. Robert, I have a question. I'm having trouble cutting my dog's nails. I've been desensitizing him since he was eight weeks by cutting his nails every Sunday. Well, that's excellent. I've since switched over to the dog Dremel to set the scene. I put him in a down position and then begin to grind down his nails, being careful of the quick and grinding in swiping motions. Now, as a six-month-old teenager, he removes his paw from my grip and tries to get up from the down position, making the progress much longer and difficult. Should he be in another position? Should I be correcting, perhaps offering treats? Or is this because of hormones and it will pass? Thanks, Robert. Hope to hear your response. Well, Nadia, real simple. At some point with the dog, the dog has to do what you want him to do. Now, holding it down, I wouldn't do. 
And I'll tell you why. It's because you're getting the dog to relate the obedience to something he doesn't like. And then later, when you really need him to hold that down, he is already fighting the down. So all you need to do is what I like to do is I like to, you know, if you put the dog up on a table or something, it's easier to grind the nails. If they're on the ground, it's harder. When I do it, Janet usually helps me. So it's, it's a little bit easier. She'll hold that dog's head or give him some treats or whatever. Don't over goad the dog into the behavior. In other words, the dog just must do what you want him to do. That's it. So once you've conditioned the dog and gotten the dog to understand it, just grab the dog, make sure, you know, back the dog into a corner, grab the dog and grind the nails. Don't overdo it. You're, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the swooping motions. You're keeping it short. You're doing it once a week. It's fine. You don't need to do it every week now once the dog's conditioned, by the way. Maybe every other week or so. But, you know, think about your own fingernails. Just look at them like I look at mine. I think, okay, i got a couple of days and I can get, give myself a little manicure here. So, Jenna says... What is the proper way to correct a dog when doing obedience? I know with a prong, but are you just doing a leash pop or are you using it directionally to guide? Or do you guide it first and once the dog knows it, use a leash pop? Love your Q&A videos. Well, Jenna, that's a great question. And I teach leash pressure for the prong, obviously, but I assume when I'm going to correct the dog, the dog knows the right behavior, right? That's important. The dog must know the right behavior and then I can correct for it. If not, I'm luring. And I don't want to lure with an aversive. I mean, like people do, you know, luring with an aversive is essentially what you do when you're teaching leash pressure, by the way. But it is to teach leash pressure. The only proper way to correct the dog is to pop him or teach him how to get away from the pressure. So if the dog is not healing properly, the dog is behind me, I can tap, tap, tap the dog up. If the dog's in front of me, I can make an about turn and pop one time and bring the dog back with me. Right? That's for obedience. That's for like more of a competitive style of obedience, if you want to do that, or a demonstration style of obedience. But those are the behaviors that you're going to have to understand. Make sure the dog understands the movement, the behavior that you've lured, shaped, and rewarded then add the corrections. And the corrections are always layered on top. And they are for the dog not doing what he understands he should do, but he's choosing not to do it, either through you know, not paying attention, stupidity, or by being a knucklehead, either way. But the, the, the correction must suit the crime. In other words, you can't overcorrect a dog and think that's going to be fair because your dog's not going to be happy about it. And you're going to lose your dog. Your dog's not going to want to work with you. So... Um, great questions, by the way, this week. These were really, really good. Um, we'll probably do some more. Like I said, I'm going to try to get some more interviews in here. I don't know if you guys are sick and tired of hearing me. I'm trying to figure out how to do the Skype interviews, how to feed people um, into the video so that I can do a Q&A with them. I think that would be really, really fun. I've got this software. I know the software can do it. i got to just sit down and, and kind of understand it a little bit better. So anyway, thank you guys for being here. Thanks for listening to my podcast. Um, be sure you check out my members only section at robertcabral.com. A lot of great stuff there. If you're looking to buy any dog gear, you want to know what I use, what I recommend, go to robertcabral.com and click on the shop. All the products in that shop are products that I either use, have used, or recommend. Um, that's always a common question. What kind of treats do I use? What about this? What kind of this? What kind of leash? What kind of tugs? All of them are there. They can all be purchased right from the shop on my site. And I do receive a small commission, which keeps the podcast going. Check out my YouTube channel. Tons of great videos there all the time, always free. Member section, there's a reasonable uh, monthly fee, but you get a lot longer videos. For the videos that are on YouTube that are five to 10 minutes long, they're 20 to 30 minutes long in my member section. They're completely spelled out. No advertising, high def, full 4K videos and everything. So guys, train your dog, love your dog, do what's right by your dog, and uh, give your dog a big hug for me. I'll see you next week.